بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد فان احسن الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدى هدى محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وان شر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار so our lecture today inshallah ta'ala is on the topic of the kalima la ilaha illa allah and the meaning of the kalima the pillars of the kalima and the conditions of the kalima so we have in front of us we have a number of things we have the meaning which is the ma'na we have the pillars the arkan the pillars and we have the shurut which are the conditions the conditions of la ilaha illallah and also if we have time there is a fourth issue which are the nullifiers the things which invalidate a person's expression of the kalima which are the nawaqid so whenever a person wants to understand the reality of the shahada of the kalima then he must understand four things the ma'na the meaning the arkan the pillars the shurut which are the conditions and the nawaqid 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 which are the things which invalidate a person's uh, shahada or his or his expression of the kalima so inshallah ta'ala in this lesson we want to focus on uh, the meaning and the conditions and if we have time the pillars and conditions and if we have time we can maybe discuss the nawaqid as well although that may take a separate lesson but in this lesson we want to begin with a brief introduction first of all before we speak about the kalima and so with this introduction we first of all point out that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to mankind five things there are five things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to mankind on the basis of which there is reward and punishment five things and those five things are as follows the first one is the fitra the fitra the second one is aql which is reason and intellect the third one is naql which which refers to revelation the fourth one is irada irada which means a will and a choice and the fifth one is qudra qudra means the ability and the power and the capability to act so there are five things that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to mankind let's let's explain each of these uh, it, uh, one by one and explain how this relates to our topic of the shahada of la ilaha illallah so as for the fitra the fitra is something that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put in every soul and this fitra is something by which a soul recognizes and knows that in everything that he sees everything that he witnesses in this creation in this world in this universe when he sees the night and the day alternating when he sees all of the favors and the bounties of allah when he sees the rain fall giving life to the earth and he sees the plants and the animals and from that there is there is his food when he puts all of these things together and he looks at these things automatically in his soul he knows that there is a creator behind all of this this is something which a person is predisposed to in other words allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has inclined mankind already to recognize this fact and to also be receptive to the call of the messengers this is from the ni'ma the mercy and the bounty of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so every single human is born with this capacity and this ability and that's why 
we see in the Quran and in the Sunnah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioning uh, the fitrah, the fitrah of Allah upon which He created and originated mankind, as occurs in Surah Rum. And likewise, in the Hadith, every new newborn child is born upon the fitrah. Is born upon the fitrah. This is the natural disposition. So the first thing that we should understand is that every single human being has this capacity and this natural uh, uh, capacity to recognize this reality and this fact. That's the first thing. The second thing is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given everybody a reason, which is aqal. And by this a person, obviously he makes uh, analogies in his mind, he uh, uh, makes analogies in his mind and he compares between things, between different things. And by way of analogies, he comes to learn things by way of pure reason. And so this is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has also given to mankind. And this reason is used in order to recognize, again, the same truth. The truth of La ilaha illallah. Now when we look in the Quran and we look at how the messengers, when they came, there's a question. Did they invite the people on the basis of the fitra or did they invite the people on the basis of reason in other words which which of the two faculties did they appeal to primarily and the answer to that is that they began by appealing to the fitra and that's why we see in in the quran uh, in surah ibrahim allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about the messengers, وَقَالَتْ رُسُلُهُمْ أَفِي اللَّهِ شَكٌّ فَاطِرِ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ Is there any doubt concerning Allah? This is what the messenger said. Is there any doubt concerning Allah, the originator of the heavens and the earth? So the, the primary method that the messengers called is to simply appeal to the people's fitrah. Why? Because the people already know and acknowledge that there is not that, that, that there is no creator that there's only one creator there's no other creator besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and so therefore it follows naturally that only he should be worshiped alone so the first thing we should understand is that the prophets they appealed to the fitra of the people primarily first and foremost however on top of that we see that people in different times and situations because of doubts which are brought to them then they may need other additional evidences, evidences of reason, when they have some doubt. Uh, you know, is there a creator? Is there a provider? Is there a sustainer? So on top of this, we see in the Quran, there are also reasons, there are also uh, arguments which involve reason, which involve the intellect. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, mentions these in the most concise, brief, powerful way in the Quran in order to remove any doubt about his existence. So we see that reason, aql, is also appealed to in the Quran and the messengers also appeal to aql, reason, but that was after appealing to fitra, the fitra of, of mankind. So these two things Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to mankind. Now we have a question here. The question is that does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala call people to account? Does he base reward and punishment just on these two things alone? On fitra and aqal? And the answer is no. Rather, reward and punishment is only applicable after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent the proof, and that proof can only be by way of revelation, by way of the revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the proof for this in the Quran is the statement of Allah, وَمَا كُنَّا مُعَذِّبِينَ حَتَّى نَبْعَثَ رَسُولًا That we would never punish up until we send a messenger. So the revelation is the basis of reward and punishment. 
even though a person might recognize the truth of the kalima la ilaha illallah by way of his fitra and by way of his aql, the actual reward and punishment only comes by way of the revelation. That's why revelation is what establishes the proof upon mankind. Now, on top of fitra and aql, Allah has given a person the will, the irada, the ability to, 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 to choose and to desire things and also to act. So we, we find that we have an irada, and we also have, we have uh, eyes and ears, we have uh, hands, we have limbs, and by way of these things we can do actions. So we have irada and qudra, and by way of this we make decisions and we choose. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the revelation has given us the two paths, the path of worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, and obeying His Messenger, and the path which opposes and separates from that path. And so on that basis, mankind will be uh, rewarded or punished after the revelation comes to uh, a person. So once we understand all of this, then the truth, there is a truth on the basis of which this whole creation is created. And that truth is what a Muslim is professing. When he says, La ilaha illallah, then he is expressing the truth on the basis of which the heavens and the earth have been created. He is speaking of the justice, the justice, the adl, upon which the whole of the universe, the heavens and the earth, upon which it rests. This is the adl, this is the justice. The justice is there is none which has the right to be worshipped in truth except Allah alone. This is the adal, the haq and the adal, the, the truth and the justice upon which the whole of the heavens and earth that they rest upon. So, once we understand all of this, then this was the call of every single prophet and every single messenger. He came and he explained to the people, La ilaha illallah. There is none which has the right to be worshipped except Allah alone. So with this, we should understand that this kalima has a meaning, it has pillars, it has conditions, and it has nullifiers. As for the first, as for the first one, then the meaning of la ilaha illallah, the meaning of la ilaha illallah, is to single out Allah with worship. This is the general meaning. We say, Ifradullahi bil ibadah. Ifradullahi bil ibadah. To single out Allah with worship. And this means that we do not worship anyone besides Allah. And when we look at this kalima, La ilaha illallah, we see there are two elements and there are two aspects in this kalima. The first of them is a negation. We are negating and denying something. And the second part is an affirmation. We are affirming something. And these two things constitute the pillars, the two pillars of the kalima la ilaha illallah. There are two arkan, two pillars. And so the first one is what we call an nafi. An nafi is negation. And the second one is affirmation, ithbat. So what, what is it that we are denying and negating? Well, this follows on from our fitra, from the natural disposition that we have. It also follows from our reason, and it also follows from the revelation. This negation is that there is nothing which is deserving of worship or servitude in this universe. That there's nothing because everything is brought about and originated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there is nothing, there is nothing besides Allah to which we can ascribe any power, any independent power, any independent creation. So because we know this and we see this, that everything that we see around us is, is created, it is made, it is originated, it has no independent power in its own right. And when we see all of this, and our fitra naturally recognizes this, and our reason also uh, comes to this conclusion. 
And Revelation also tells us this, that there can be nothing which is a creator besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so, so therefore, it follows that there is no other deity or God or object of worship besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there's nothing besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the first thing, this is the negation that we find. La ilaha, this is what we are negating. There is nothing worthy of worship. There is no deity. No deity exists in truth that deserves to be worshipped. And then the second half is an affirmation. Illallah. This is the ithbat. This is the affirmation. And here we make the affirmation for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. And so this really means, the true and real meaning is La ilaha haqqun illallah. La ilaha haqqun illallah. There is no deity in truth. There is no ilah in truth except Allah. And also we can say, لا معبود بحق إلا الله. There is no deity, there is no object of worship in truth except Allah alone, without any partners. So these are the two pillars, and this is the meaning of the kalima. And what a person should understand is that just because a person might recognize and know this in his heart, that does not make him a Muslim. That does not enter him into Iman or into Islam. And this is something that we shall uh, look at when we look at the conditions of La ilaha illallah, that just because a person, he knows and recognizes there is none which has the right to be worshipped except Allah alone, that mere recognition and knowledge in and of itself does not enter him into Iman or into, or into Iman. And that's why we see that when we look at the people in the time of the Messenger Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there were various groups of people. There were the Jews and the Christians. There were the pagan Arabs. There were the hypocrites. And we see that many of them they actually knew and recognized. They knew the truth. They knew La ilaha illallah is the truth. And they knew that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. Like the Jews, for example, they knew this. They had this knowledge and they had this recognition. But that did not enter them into Islam. Why? Because they were missing some of the conditions of the kalima La ilaha illallah. And they had some of the nullifiers, things which invalidated their the, the, their iman. Likewise, the hypocrites, many of the hypocrites, they may be new, they knew the truth, that this is, the, this, this is indeed the truth. But then, because they wanted to protect their wealth, and they wanted to protect their status, they concealed disbelief and outwardly portrayed belief. And the same with, <coughs> uh, the, we find amongst the Jews and the Christians who knew, as a matter of fact, that the messenger was sent by Allah, and likewise many of the pagan Arabs, they likewise knew that this was the truth, but they didn't want to abandon and leave their gods which they were, which they were worshipping besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the point that we are making here is <coughs> that a person might know by his natural disposition, by his fitra, he may also know by way of his aql and his reason. And he may also know when revelation has come to him that this is indeed the truth. But despite all of that, despite all of these things and his, and his knowledge, that still would not enter him into Iman. And for that reason, uh, this is why it follows on from this once we understand the ma'na, the meaning, and we understand the pillars of La ilaha illallah, it follows on from this the conditions of La ilaha illallah, the shurut, the conditions of La ilaha illallah. Because by way of these conditions, we then come to understand why and how a person's uh, 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 attachment to Iman, his attachment to Islam, why it may be invalid and why it may be incorrect. <clears throat> so, this now leads us to the conditions of La ilaha illallah. And these conditions of La ilaha illallah, <clears throat> we should understand that 
these conditions have been likened to a key. As we see from the Imam uh, Al Hassan Al Basri from the Tabi'een, the Imam of the ta one of the Imams of the Tabi'een, Rahimahullah Taala, he said to a person, a person said to him when he was burying his wife, a person's wife died, and he was burying his wife, and Hassan Al Basri said to him, he said, "What have you prepared for this day? What have you prepared for this day?" And this person said, Shahadatu Allah ilaha illallah munzu sab'ina sana. That for 70 years, for 70 years, I have prepared with the testification, La ilaha illallah. So Hassan al Basri said to him in return, Ni'mal udda. He said, What an excellent preparation you have made. And then he said, Inna lila ilaha illallah shurutan. He said, indeed, this la ilaha illallah has certain conditions. So do not make accusations against the women, against the, 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 the pious, righteous, innocent women. So in other words, al Hasan al-Basri said to him that the kalima has conditions. So do not invalidate those conditions by accusing pious chaste women of something which they are free and innocent of. In other words, this means that in our actions there are things which will clash with and possibly even invalidate our, our Iman. And then also, another Imam from the Tabi'een, uh, Wahab bin Munabbih, and he is from the first century of Islam. He died in the year 110 Hijrah. And in fact, al Hasan al-Basri, also died in the year 110 Hijrah. Now, Wahab bin Munabbih, he, it was said to him, it was said to him, is not La ilaha illallah the key, the key to paradise, the, the Miftahul Jannah? And he replied, yes, yes. And he said, however, every key, uh, every key has teeth. And so if you brought the key, and the key does not have any teeth, then it will not open the door. It will not open for you. So in other words, La ilaha illallah is the key to paradise, but every key has teeth. And without those teeth, it will not open the door. And so these teeth are the conditions of La ilaha illallah. And so the scholars have mentioned that these teeth there are seven teeth, and some of the scholars have added an eighth one. So there are seven or eight, and inshallah we will look at each one of those. And I will mention them at this point, all of them at this stage, the seven at this stage, and they are as follows. Number one, knowledge, ilmun, knowledge. Number two, certainty, yaqeen. And in fact, if you pay attention, there is a connection between each and every single one of them. Just like the teeth of a key, there's obviously a connection between each one of them. They follow on from each other and they are connected to each other. Then likewise, you will see that there is, there is a connection. And as we go through each of these conditions, we shall explain the connection between each one of them, inshallah ta'ala. So, the first one is knowledge, ilmun. The second one is yaqeen, certainty. The third one is ikhlas, which is sincerity. The fourth one is sidq, which is truthfulness. The fifth one is muhabba, which is love. The sixth one is inqiyad, inqiyad, which means compliance. And the seventh one is qabul, which is qabul, which is acceptance. Now, each of these seven uh, conditions they also have an opposite. They have an opposite. So we understand it in light of its opposite. For example, the first one, ilm, there is knowledge, which clashes with jahl, which is ignorance. So knowledge has to remove ignorance. And likewise, by way of example, the second one, certainty, which is yaqeen. Yaqeen, it clashes with doubt, shak. So yaqeen has to eliminate Doubt, shak. So when we speak of the seven conditions, 
We speak of the seven conditions, but also their opposites. Because when a condition is present, then the opposite has been removed. And this is the intention behind all of this, behind all of the, the, the discussion, discussing the conditions of La ilaha illallah. So let's begin and let's start with the first condition. And the first condition, which comes before everything else, it is knowledge which invalidates ignorance. Knowledge which removes ignorance. Al-ilmu al-munafi lil-jahl. Knowledge which removes ignorance. Now this knowledge is the knowledge that we've discussed in the first part of the lesson. The realization, the knowledge that there is none, there is no thing, no person, no stone, no tree, no uh, power that we see, the power of the wind, the power of the sea. Nothing of that, there, there is nothing, no person, no prophet, no angel, no jinn. No, uh, uh, absolutely nothing, no planet, nothing that has the right to be worshipped. Why? Because all of these things are created. They are originated. They were brought into existence by another power and by another being, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that knowledge, to have that knowledge and to have that understanding, to understand it in the way that we explained, then this is the first condition to actually grasp and understand that knowledge to know that nothing has the right to be worshipped except Allah and everything else besides him to worship it is false and it is batil it is false it clashes with the truth and the justice upon which the heavens and the earth have been created right to have that knowledge and the evidence the evidences for this in the Quran is in Surah Muhammad, Surah 47, verse number 19. Allah says, فَعْلَمْ فَعْلَمْ Have the knowledge, have the knowledge, أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ That there is none which has a right, the right to be worshipped alone except Allah. This is a clear evidence. فَعْلَمْ Have knowledge, which means have the understanding. Have the understanding that there is none which has a right to be worshipped except Allah. And likewise, Allah says in Surah Al-Zukhruf, the 43rd surah, verse number 86, إِلَّا مَنْ شَهِدَ بِالْحَقِّ وَهُمْ يَعْلَمُونَ Except those who witness to the truth whilst they have knowledge. Whilst they have knowledge, whilst they have ilm. And likewise in the uh, hadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, مَنْ مَاتَ وَهُوَ يَعْلَمُ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ دَخَلَ الْجَنَّةِ Whoever dies... And he knows that there is none which has the right to be worshipped except Allah, he will enter paradise. Okay, so we see that in all of these texts, we see the condition of knowledge. And this means, <clears throat> uh, this means that a person, when he speaks it, he knows its meaning. If a person was just to say, La ilaha illallah, in and of itself, and in his heart he does not grasp and know the meaning, then the condition would not be fulfilled. Rather, the ignorance has to be removed. And the ignorance is removed by way of faham, by way of understanding, not just by way of merely repeating on the tongue. So when we say al-ilm, when we say knowledge, we mean understanding of the kalima. And then that understanding is something that removes the ignorance. So, this is the first condition. We have to be very clear. It is not just repeating the kalima. That is something that might enter a person into Islam outwardly. But inwardly there has to be faham. There has to be understanding. Because only then understanding removes the ignorance. As for the second condition. Now the second condition is something that follows on from the first condition. When you have an understanding in your mind that there is none which has the right to be worshipped except Allah alone, then that knowledge, there has to be yaqeen, there has to be certainty in that knowledge. In other words, there mustn't be any doubt. You cannot have any doubt because sometimes a person might understand the meaning of something. He might understand the meaning. 
but then he might start doubting in its truthfulness. He might start having shuk, which is doubt. And for that reason, the first condition is not complete except in the presence of the second condition. And the second condition is yaqeen. He must have certainty that this understanding that he has is actually the truth. And that's why uh, the second condition, yaqeen, is something which invalidates and removes shak, which is doubt. And he has no doubt whatsoever that there is none which has the right to be worshipped except Allah alone. So that, so that when he, any so that when any doubts come to him, and any shubuhat come to him, then he has no doubt that they are false, and he has certainty in the kalima la ilaha illallah. So what are the evidences? The evidences, first of all, in the Quran is in Surah Al-Hujurat, the 49th Surah, verse number 15. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, He's describing the believers. He says, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ ثُمَّ لَمْ يَرْتَابُوا ثُمَّ لَمْ يَرْتَابُوا Indeed, the believers are those who believe in Allah, and believe in his messenger, then they do not have any doubt. Lam yartabu. They do not have any doubt. In other words, they have yaqeen in that which they are prophet, which has the right to be worshipped except Allah alone. So therefore, we see that having certainty is a condition of the kalima. Is a condition of the kalima. Likewise, in the sunnah, we see the Messenger Muhammad saying, he said, he said that when a person says La ilaha illallah, when a person testifies Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa anni rasulullah, when a person testifies to the kalima and that I am the Messenger of Allah, La yalqa allaha bihima abdun ghayru shakin fihima illa dakhla al jannah. That no servant meets Allah having said these two statements without doubting in them, without having any doubt in them both, except that he will enter paradise. So we see that the messenger said, غير شاكين, without being doubtful. So again, we see this condition mentioned clearly in this hadith, which is reported in Sahih Muslim. And likewise, we see also in Sahih Muslim, the hadith of Abu Huraira, radiallahu anhu, who said, he said that the messenger of Allah said to him, he said, or he said, uh, whomever you see, he commanded and said, go and whomever you see behind this wall, testifying that none has the right to be worshipped except Allah, mustaqinan biha qalbuhu, mustaqinan biha qalbuhu. The one who testifies with La ilaha illallah and his heart having absolute certainty, then give him glad tiding of paradise. فَبَشِّرْهُ Jannah. Give him glad tiding of paradise. So again, we see that the messenger he mentioned here, مُسْتَيْقِنًا Being absolutely certain and having certainty. So from all of this now, we understand clearly <coughs> that it is not sufficient merely for a person to know and understand. To know and understand. Why? Because we see there are many people, there are many people who know and understand the kalima. There may be many of the non-Muslims, many of the kuffar, many of them might understand from his reason, from his aql, from his reason. He might understand, yes, I, I understand that the, the evidence proves there is a creator. I understand that it follows, uh, it follows by reason that none has the right to be worshipped except that creator. It follows that he should be obeyed. I understand all of that. And, you know, he understands the meaning. But then he starts having a doubt. He said, well, but, you know, maybe this, maybe that, maybe this, maybe this, maybe that. Maybe, you know, then all these doubts start coming to his mind. So the, 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 the shak, even though a person might understand what the kalima means, then the doubt has to be completely removed. And this is by yaqeen by way of certainty. Now, once we have these two things, we understand the meaning, we have the ilm, we have the fahm, 
and there is no jahl, we've removed the jahl, the ignorance, and likewise we have the certainty, the yaqeen, then the third thing which follows is that there must be qubul, there must be acceptance. Why? Because the first two things, al-ilm and yaqeen, sometimes these two things can be present in a person, but still he does not accept. And there are certain reasons why he may not accept. So the third thing which has to follow is qubul, 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 which is acceptance. And what is meant by this, what is meant by qubul is that a person must accept that when he has understood the kalima and when he has certainty in the kalima, that it follows from this ilm and yaqeen that there must be certain things which are required from him by way of speech and action and behavior. Right? This is what we mean by qubul. By qubul we mean that a person acknowledges and accepts that there are certain things which follow on from his knowledge and understanding of the kalima and his yaqeen in the kalima. And these things include that there must be certain things in his heart, there must be certain things in his speech, there must be certain things in his actions, which are a natural consequence. They follow on from the first two conditions. So this is what we mean by qubul, that he accepts that on his tongue and on his action, there is a certain behavior required from him. Why is this a condition? This is a condition because... There are certain types of people that the Qur'an has mentioned who understand the kalima, who have certainty that the kalima is the truth, but they have arrogance. They do not accept. They have pride and they have arrogance. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He mentioned about the mushrikun, the pagans. He said about them in the Qur'an, إِنَّهُمْ كانوا إذا قيل لهم لا إله إلا الله يستكبرون that they when it used to be said to them لا إله إلا الله يستكبرون they would have arrogance so when it was said to them لا إله إلا الله they knew in their hearts and they understood what this means and they knew that it is the truth they had علم and they had يقين that this is the truth but then because of their arrogance the كبر and istikbar, they did not have qubul, they did not, they did not accept it, they did, they did not accept it. This ayah is in Surah Safat, Surah 37, verse number 35. And likewise, uh, we see, and there are, in fact there are many other evidences of this uh, that show that the mushrikeen never, accept, never showed acceptance, even though they understood the meaning and had certainty in it. Now, what are the evidences of Qubul in the Qur'an? We see in Surah An-Nur, Surah 24, verse number 51, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He describes the believers. He says, He says about them, He says about them, إِنَّمَا كَانَ قَوْلَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ إِذَا دُعُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ لِيَحْكُمَ بَيْنَهُمْ أَنْ يَقُولُوا سَمِئْنَا وَأَطَعْنَا وَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ Allah says, indeed, the saying of the believers, when they are invited to Allah and His Messenger, that He may judge between them, أَنْ يَقُولُوا سَمِئْنَا وَأَتَعْنَا That they say, we hear and we obey. This is a sign of qubul, this is a sign of acceptance. وَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ They are the ones who will be great, they are the ones who will be successful. And likewise, in Surah Al-Ahzab, Surah 33, verse number 36, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also describes the way of the believers. He says, وَمَا كَانَ لِمُؤْمِنٍ وَلَا مُؤْمِنَةٍ إِذَا قَضَ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ أَمْرًا أَنْ يَكُونَ لَهُمُ الْخِيَارَةُ مِنْ أَمْرِهِمْ وَمَنْ يَعْسِ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ فَقَدْ ضَلَّ ضَلَالًا مُبِينًا It is not for any believing man or believing woman when Allah and His Messenger have decided on an affair, that they should have any choice in the matter. Whoever disobeys Allah and His Messenger, then they have gone far, far astray. Now, 
these two verses and explain the way of the believer. The way of the believer is to accept, to make qubul of that which comes from Allah and His Messenger. And likewise, the hadith, there is the hadith, you, you know the famous hadith, the hadith in which the Messenger of Allah وسلم, he gives a parable, he gives a similitude of the people being like three types of land. There are three types of land. The first land is one which when it rains, it accepts the rain and it produces the, uh, you know, it produces the herbage. You know, there, there is grass and herbs and plants which grow from it, which the people benefit from. So it receives the knowledge and it also produces the, uh, the, the, the fruits and the results of that. And this is the likeness of the rain. The rain comes down, the land accepts the rain. And then the rain produces the plants and the fruits. So this is like knowledge. There are some people who accept the knowledge, they understand the knowledge, and then the knowledge produces fruits in their behavior, in their action. This is the first parable. The second example from this parable is, a second type of land, is that the land accepts the water, it accepts the water and it stores the water, but it does not produce any fruits or any plants or any herbage. However, the people can still benefit because they can benefit from the water. They can take the water from that land. So this is a second type of person who, although he may not benefit other people by the fruits of knowledge, he nevertheless accepts the knowledge. And then the third type of land is a barren land. It does not accept the water and obviously cannot produce any fruits. So this third example, the point being from this third example is that it is unlike the first two examples. It does not accept, there's no qubul, there's no acceptance, there's no acceptance. So this hadith can also be used, this hadith is a hadith narrated in Sahih al-Bukhari and he mentions this hadith in the book of knowledge. And this hadith can be used to indicate and to show the condition of acceptance, of qubul. So, now we have three conditions, and notice how all of these three conditions are connected, and how each of them follow on from the other ones. Now we have the fourth condition. The fourth condition follows on from the first three conditions. Right, so again, the fourth condition follows on from the first three conditions, and the fourth condition is al inqiyad Al 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 Inkiyad Al Inkiyad Al Inkiyad is compliance to comply to comply to to be in agreement by one's actions to comply. Now again, think about it. A person might have understanding of the kalima. He might have certainty in the kalima. He might accept, he will accept, yes, I accept that all of this is, is you know, requires upon me that I act and I, I, I behave in a certain way. So he will have qubul as well. But despite all of these three conditions being present, he might still not make inkiyad, inkiyad. He might not comply, meaning that in his speech and his behavior, he will not, he will not bring and implement that which is required from him, from the first three conditions. So, that's why inqiyad is also a condition, and it means al-ittiba. It means to it means to follow in one's actions. A person has to follow in one's actions. Why? Because when we speak of qubul, qubul simply means that with your speech. You've agreed and you've said, yes, I am required to act upon this knowledge. This is Qabul. You've just simply said it. You, you might believe it in your heart that I'm required to act. And you might say it with your tongue, I'm required to act. At this point, it is just something that you are affirming and accepting. But it does not mean, you know, it, it means that you have to prove that you've made Qabul. And this only occurs by way of inqiyad. And this is compliance. And this compliance means al-ittiba, actual uh, implementing in your actions. And so this is the 
fourth condition. And the proof for this is the following. First of all, the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, وَمَنْ يُسْلِمْ وَجْهَهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَهُوَ مُحْسِنٌ فَقَدْ إِسْتَمْسَكَ بِالْعُرْوَةِ الْوُثْقَى Whoever sub submits his face to Allah, whoever submits his face to Allah, and this means whoever has the knowledge of La ilaha illallah, whoever has certainty in that, whoever accepts that, وَهُوَ مُحْسِنٌ وَهُوَ مُحْسِنٌ and is the one who does good, then he is the one who holds on to the trustworthy handhold. So notice how in this verse, Allah mentions the one who submits his face and then does good. وَهُوَ مُحْسِنٌ He has to do good. And doing good is the practical outward actions. So we, so we see that Allah made both things a requirement. This is in Surah Luqman, Surah 31, verse 22. Likewise, in the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ دِينًا مِمَّنْ أَسْلَمَ وَجْهَهُ لِلَّهِ وَهُوَ مُحْسِنٌ وَاتَّبَعَ مِلَّةَ إِبْرَاهِيمَ حَنِيفًا Notice how in this verse Allah says, Who is better in religion than the one who submits his face? Submitting his face, meaning the first few conditions of La ilaha illallah, he accepts La ilaha illallah, he knows it is the truth, he acknowledges, he makes qabool. And then he says, وَهُوَ muhsinun," And he is the one who does good. وَتَّبَعَ وَتَّبَعَ Then he makes ittiba. He follows in his action. مِلَّةَ إِبْرَاهِيمَ Hanifa. He follows the, the millah, the way of Ibrahim, the, 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 the upright uh, uh, religion of Ibrahim. So, this is in Surah An-Nisa, Surah 4, verse number 125. So we see again, there is mention of Ihsan and Ittiba. Doing good and, and, and making Ittiba. In the third evidence, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, وَأَنِيبُوا إِلَىٰ رَبِّكُمْ وَأَسْلِمُوا لَهِ Which means turn back to your Lord and submit to Him. So we mentioned two things, Al-Islam, to submit, and Al-Inaba, which is turn back to Allah, which means in action. And this is Surah Zumar, Surah 39, Verse 40, 45. So all of these evidences indicate al-ittiba and al-ihsan and al-inaba. All of these things imply action. And all of this is a condition which follows on from the first three conditions of la ilaha illallah. Okay, now it doesn't stop there. Because a person might bring all of these things Al-ilm, al-yaqeen, uh, uh, al-qabool, uh, and the fourth one, which is uh, which is the the uh, the the, the inqiyad. But after this, there is another condition that also follows, and upon which all of the previous ones they depend upon this. And what is this? It is a sidq. A sidq is truthfulness, being truthful. And this truthfulness is something that removes hypocrisy. It removes, it eliminates hypocrisy. And this truthfulness, it means that you are truthful in everything that you are doing and that you are saying and that you are believing. And uh, it is something that eliminates the, the, the hypocrisy, the, the, the possibility of hypocrisy, of nifaq, and it is a sign of certainty. And the evidences for truthfulness as sidq is we see at the beginning of Surah Al-Ankabut, Surah Al-Ankabut, Surah number 29, verse number 1 and 2, Allah says, Alif Lam Mim, أَحَسِبَ النَّاسُ أَنْ يُتْرَكُوا أَنْ يَقُولُوا آمَنَّا وَهُمْ لَا يُفْتَنُونَ do the people think that they will be left alone in saying that we believe and they will not be tested? We indeed tested those who came before them and Allah certainly knew those who were truthful. 
وَلَا يَعْلَمَنَّ الْكَاذِبِينَ And he will certainly know those who are the liars. Now, what is this referring to? The scholars like Sheikh Salih Al-Fawzan and others, they explain that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would never ever leave the believers just proclaiming Iman. Proclaiming Iman. Rather, it is a law in Allah's creation that He will put the believers through trials and tests and calamities so that those who are truthful, the sadiqeen, will be separated from those who are the kadibin, the liars. Why? Because there are hypocrites amongst the Muslimin, amongst the, 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 the people, people of Islam. And it is only when certain trials and calamities take place, when the reality of these people comes out, when what they are concealing in their hearts, when it becomes apparent in their speech and in their behavior. So when trials and calamities take place, it is then when we see clearly from the speech and the actions of these people that which they have been concealing and which shows that they are hypocrites. They are, they are not truthful in their kalima. They're not truthful in the kalima. They might have knowledge and understanding. They might have certainty in the meaning. They might even accept the meaning outwardly. And they might even outwardly act upon some of the things. We, for example, we see the hypocrites. They pray along with the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu they, they are with the Muslims. They do righteous deeds. They give the zakah. They, they do the hajj. Everything. All of this appears to be kabul. This appears to be acceptance on their behalf. But the sidq, the truthfulness, is something which, which is inside the heart and which only Allah knows, but which in certain situations by way of calamities and trials, Allah brings it out of the people to see are they really truthful when they say the kalima. So this ayah is a proof of sidq, the condition of sidq. And likewise, Allah mentions specifically about the hypocrites at the beginning of Surah Al-Munafiqoon. Allah says, إِذَا جَاءَكَ الْمُنَافِقُونَ قَالُوا نَشْهَدُ إِنَّكَ لَرَسُولُ اللَّهِ وَاللَّهُ يَعْلَمُ إِنَّكَ لَرَسُولُهُ وَاللَّهُ يَشْهَدُ إِنَّ الْمُنَافِقِينَ لَكَاذِبُونَ says, when the hypocrites come to you, to the messenger, and they say, we testify that you are the messenger of Allah, then Allah knows that you indeed are his messenger. But Allah witnesses that indeed the hypocrites are liars. They are, li they are not truthful, they are liars in what they say. So we see that the hypocrites say with their tongues and they do with their actions that which, you know, with their, with that which clashes with what is inside their hearts, in their side of their hearts, there is kadib, there is a lie, there is hypocrisy. And so we see this condition of sidq is vital to the, to, to, to la ilaha illallah. And we see in the sunnah as well, there is an evidence for this. The messenger of Allah he said, مَا مِنْ أَحَدٍ يَشْهَدُ أَنْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَأَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صِدْقًا صِدْقًا مِنْ قَلْبِهِ إِلَّا حَرَّمَهُ اللَّهُ عَلَى النَّارِ He said, there is no one who witnesses, there is none which has a right to be worshipped except Allah alone, and that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. Truthfully, truthfully, صِدْقًا, truthfully from his heart, except that Allah has made the fire unlawful upon him. And likewise, when the, uh, the, the, when the Prophet ﷺ, he taught a man, he taught a Bedouin, he taught him the various affairs of Islam. He taught him the various affairs of Islam. And this Bedouin said, by Allah, I will not add anything to this, nor will I take anything away from this. Meaning, I will act upon everything you've told me without adding to it or taking away from it. And then the Messenger of Allah ﷺ, he said, Aflaha in sadaqa." He said, this man will be successful if he is truthful. If he is truthful. And this hadith is in Al-Bukhari. Likewise, the previous hadith was also in the Sahih of Al-Bukhari. So all of these verses, the two verses and these two hadith, they, ask, they establish the condition of uh, truthfulness in La ilaha illallah. Now after this, we have another condition which follows on from all of the rest.
it follows on from all of the rest, meaning that this sixth condition is also necessary, is also necessary. And without this sixth condition, then everything a person does and says and acts upon, meaning the, the, the sidq that he has in his ittiba and so on and so forth, it is still not acceptable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is the condition of al-ikhlas. Al-ikhlas, which is sincerity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now a person might have knowledge, he might have ilm, knowledge of the meaning of la ilaha illallah. He might have certainty in that, that meaning and that understanding, yaqeen. He might have acceptance, he might make qubool of the meaning which he is certain of. Then he might make inqiyad, he might outwardly comply, and he might be truthful in all of that. He might have siddh in all of that, as opposed to nifaq. But then on top of this, if he is not sincere, meaning that he's not that, that, that he is doing it only for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not for any other thing, not for showing off, not to be heard or, or spoken about, not for any other reason, only then is his action, his inqiyad, only then is it acceptable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is the sixth condition which is al-ikhlas, sincerity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that means that when he does an action, when he does a speech, when he obeys Allah and his messenger, that it is not to please the people, it is not to be, uh, to, to be you know, wanting to be spoken about, it is only for the pleasure and sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And likewise, also it, the meaning from this is that he does not make this worship for other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in terms of uh, shirk. Rather, he makes the deen purely for Allah in both ways. In the sense that his ibadah is only for Allah, not for anyone besides him. So there is no shirk. And then when he worships Allah, his intention is only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in both ways, he has ikhlas to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The evidences, number one, Surah Al-Zumar, Surah 39, verse number three, Ala lillahi dinul khalis, indeed to Allah belongs the pure, the, 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 the sincere pure religion. And likewise, Allah says in Surah Al-Bayyina, Surah 98, verse number five, وَمَا أُمِرُوا إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُ اللَّهَ مُخْلِصِينَ لَهُ الدِّينَ حُنَفَاءَ they were not commanded except to worship Allah alone, pure and sincere, making the religion purely and sincerely for Him alone, upright in the religion. And likewise, the hadith of the Messenger of Allah, Inna Allaha harrama ala nar man qala la ilaha illallah yabtaghi bidhalika wajh Allah. Indeed, Allah has made unlawful the fire for the person who says la ilaha illallah, seeking the face of Allah by way of that. Which means being having ikhlas, being sincere, not having riya, not having showing off, not having you know these things which 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 invalidate a person's sincerity. And likewise, the messenger said in a hadith reported in Al Bukhari as well, "As'adun nas bi shifaati man qala la ilaha illallah khalisan min qalbihi." The most happy of people in receiving my intercession is the one who says La ilaha illallah sincerely and purely from his heart. He has ikhlas. And ikhlas means you do not worship anyone besides Allah and nor do, do you do your action for anyone besides Allah. Your action is sincerely for the sake of Allah. So this now is ikhlas. Every other condition which came before it is dependent upon ikhlas. Now we move to the seventh condition which is love, al-mahabba, al-mahabba. And without al-mahabba, all of the other conditions of la ilaha illallah are not valid. Why? Because the difference between worship and non-worship is mahabba. In fact, one of the definitions of ibadah, as the scholars explain, is that ibadah, is humility with love. Adhul, adhul wal mahabba. 
Humility means that you submit yourself, you are humble. And al-mahabba means that you, are, that you love the one with whom you are humbling yourself to. There cannot be worship except with both of these things. Now let me give you an example. And this is the example that is given by the scholars like Ibn Taymiyyah and other than them. If you look at the Bani Israel, the Bani Israel, they were held in servitude by Fir'aun. They were enslaved by Fir'aun. And so therefore, they were humbled. They were humbled. They were made to obey Fir'aun. So here we have that they have dhul. They have dhul, meaning that they've been subdued, they've been humbled, they've been made to obey the Fir'aun. Does this count as worship? The answer is no, because because obedience which is like this can never ever be considered to be worship. It is only when there is mahabba, when this obedience is done out of love, only then can it can be considered to be worship. And likewise, the other way around, when a person claims that he has love, there is mahabba, but we do not see him having any compliance or obedience then this can never ever be considered to be worship. Rather, worship is only humility with love, meaning servitude, adhul, being humbled and being obedient alongside mahabba. So, the point being here is that a person may have ilm, knowledge. He might have certainty in that knowledge. He might make qabool of what that knowledge requires from him. He might make inqiyad. He might comply with all of that. He might, you know, he might make compliance with, 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 with all of that. Then on top of this, he might have sidq. He might be truthful in all of that. And likewise, he might have ikhlas. He might have sincerity in all of that. But does he love what he is doing? Is he doing it out of love? And if he doesn't, then this would not, this, this, this is a condition of la ilaha illallah. It would not make his la ilaha illallah and anything that he does, it would not make it acceptable up until he brings the condition of mahabba, la ila, uh, uh, the mahabba, the condition of love. Now, what is the proof for this? The proof for this is, first of all, we know that anyone who claims to uh, love Allah, uh, you know, and then we find that he doesn't, you know, he doesn't... Uh, you know, bring the various actions, he cannot be truthful in his heart. But the evidence for this in the Quran is the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَتَّخِذُ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ أَنْدَادًا يُحِبُّونَهُمْ كَحُبِّ اللَّهِ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَشَدُّ حُبًّا لِلَّهِ Allah says, amongst mankind are those who take for worship partners and rivals to Allah they love them as they truly should love Allah. But those who believe are more intense in their love of Allah. Now there are two meanings to this ayah. The first meaning is that the believers are more intense and severe in their love of Allah than the mushrikeen, the pagans, love Allah. Or the second meaning is that the believers are more intense in their love of Allah than the pagans love their gods that they worship besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This ayah conveys both uh, meanings. And the second proof is the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مَنْ يَرْتَدَّ مِنْكُمْ عَنْ دِينِهِ فَسَوْفَ يَأْتِ اللَّهُ بِقَوْمٍ يُحِبُّهُمْ وَيُحِبُّونَهُ Or you who believe, if you abandon your religion, then Allah will soon bring a people whom He loves, and they love him, and they love him. So this shows that the believers they have that they have love of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. There is there is clearly the presence of love in the hearts for Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and everything they do, all the actions that they do, it arises, it emanates from the love of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. And likewise, the hadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said. There are three qualities, Talathun Man Kunna Fihi Wajada Bihinna Halawatal Iman. There are three things which if a person has them, he will find the sweetness of the taste of Iman and 
He says that Allah and His Messenger are more beloved to Him than that which is besides them. So this establishes that a believer in his heart, he has, he has the love of Allah and His Messenger, and that is what is behind his ibadah, his compliance, his, you know, and so on and so forth. So this is the seventh condition. And the important thing for you to realize is look at the step-by-step -step connection between each and every single condition of the kalima la ilaha illallah. This is the key thing that you should understand in your mind, the step-by-step -step connection between each and every condition of la ilaha illallah. And then you will truly understand the meaning of the kalima, the conditions of the kalima, the pillars of the kalima and the connection between each condition. All the conditions, they are, they are connected and they must be taken as a whole. They must be taken as a whole, otherwise the kalima would be invalid. Now we can conclude and finish with what some of the scholars, some of the scholars, they add an eighth condition. And the eighth condition is Al-Kufr Bittagut. Al-Kufr Bittagut, which is to disbelieve in all of the false deities and gods which are worshipped besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The scholars add this as an, as an eighth condition. The evidence for this is in Surat, uh, uh, Surat al-Baqarah, verse 256, immediately after Ayat al-Kursi, Allah says, لا, إكرا, لا إكراها في الدين قد تبين الرشد من الغي فمن يكفر بالطاغوت ويؤمن بالله فقد استمسك بالعروة الوثقى لن فسام لها والله سمي عليم There is no compulsion in religion. The truth has been made clear from misguidance. Whoever disbelieves in الطاغوت and believes in Allah, he has the most trustworthy firm handhold which can never break. When Allah is all hearing, all knowing. In this ayah, and there are other evidences as well, it establishes that a person must reject and disbelieve in all other deities and gods which are worshipped besides Allah and believe that their worship is falsehood, that worshipping them is batil, is falsehood, and it clashes with the truth and the justice upon which the heavens and the earth have been created. He must firmly believe that in his heart to disbelieve in the Taghut. And so this is an eighth condition that some of the scholars uh, mention. And with this, we have concluded our discussion of the conditions of the Kalima. And so this brings us to the end of our lesson. And so just to summarize, we said that the Kalima La Ilaha Illallah is the truth upon which the heavens and the earth have been created. We mentioned five things Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to mankind on the basis of which reward and punishment has been justified. And that is fitra, fitra, the natural disposition, the aql, which is uh, uh, reason, the revelation, which is naql, the irada, which is the wish, and the qudra, which is power. By all of these things, the, the responsibility is on the shoulders of mankind. And the reward and the punishment is justified. Then we said that the messengers came and they called to La ilaha illallah. First by reason, first, first by way of the fitra, and then by way of the reason if it was necessary. We said that by, by way of the messengers and the books, Allah has established the proof upon mankind. What is mankind being called to? They are being called to La ilaha illallah. Because this is the obvious truth that we recognize when we look at all of the universe and the creation. This kalima, its meaning is, there is none which has a right to be worshipped in truth, except Allah alone. It has two pillars. It has two pillars. An nafi, which is negation, and al ithbat, which is affirmation. And then on top of the meaning and the pillars, there are seven conditions. And those seven conditions we've mentioned, there are knowledge, ilm, Certainty, yaqeen, ikhlas, sincerity, sidq, which is truthfulness. Uh, then we have inqiyad, which is, uh, we, we have qabul, sorry, after that, qabul, after ikhlas, 
then we have Sidh, which is truthfulness, then we have Inqiyad, which is compliance, then we have Muhabba, which is love. All of these, there is a step-by-step -step connection between each and every single one. And finally, some of the scholars, they add Al-Kufr bit taghut to make the entire meaning more complete, and this was the eighth condition. And so with that, we conclude our lesson today. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Jazakumullah. Oh, mashallah. Uh, we just uh, have um, some few questions. Some uh, few questions, if it's possible. Uh, My name is Arsen. Uh, I'm a friend, uh, Jamal's friend, so I just want to ask one question. Uh, um, as you know, uh, there are Muslims uh, who reside in ex Soviet countries, like in Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, who call themselves yeah. as a Muslims. But they do not recognize. Uh, but uh, they also recognize the obligations, uh, the, like uh, fasting, praying, and other obligations. But they don't yeah. pray. They don't fast. So, uh, what's our uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, what's our attitude should be toward them? Uh, okay. So the Muslim. The, the question is then: that in, in in many of these ex-Soviet uh, uh, countries, we see there are Muslims who ascribe to Islam. Uh, uh, you know, on, on outwardly and on the surface, but we see that they don't practice the symbols of Islam, like, for example, uh, the, the prayer and fasting. So your question is, what is our position uh, with respect to them? Yes, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Well, first of all, the scholars, when they discuss the things which invalidate a person's Islam as it relates to the five pillars, the five pillars, then the scholars explain that... There is no agreement between the scholars regarding the four pillars which come after the first pillar. In other words, when we look at the prayer and the fasting and we look at the, 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 the hajj and likewise the charity, the zakah, we find there is no agreement between the scholars that to abandon one of them or to abandon all of them expels a person from Islam, right? To leave the zakah, so if you believe the zakah is wajib, but you don't give it, you are sinful, not a disbeliever. If you believe the hajj is obligatory, but you don't do it out of laziness or whatever, this does not take you outside the fold of Islam. Mm -hmm. If you uh, don't fast, if you don't do the fasting, but you believe it is obligatory upon you, then this does not take you outside the fold of Islam. Right, so these are the three pillars: the zakah, the 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 the, 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 the fasting, and the hajj. Mm -hmm. So there's no there's no uh, all of this is agreed upon that if you believe they are obligatory, but you leave them, you are sinful, but not a disbeliever. Mm -hmm. As for the prayer itself, then the prayer, this is something that the scholars have differed upon, and they've said that a person who leaves the prayer, even if he is lazy, he's a disbeliever. But there are many, many, many scholars who have said even if he is lazy and he leaves the prayer, then he is not considered to be a disbeliever. Why? Because there are very strong evidences in the, in, in the sunnah that establish that even such a person, that the, that the kalima and the shahada will be something which will save him if he says it out of sincerity and out of, uh, out of, out of sincerity. So these two views exist amongst the scholars of the Muslims past and present and so therefore on the basis of this the answer is that if these people they believe in the kalima and they say la, they say la ilaha illallah and they believe that the pillars are obligatory but they don't do them out of lazy, laziness neglect and so on and so forth and also because naturally speaking in all of these ex-Soviet countries we see that there's much ignorance amongst the, the people who attach to Islam, a great deal of fear and so on and so forth, then we, 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 inshallah, we affirm Islam for them. We affirm, we treat them to be Muslims outwardly apparently. And we understand that there are reasons and circumstances which lead to why a whole people in a whole region might have such a weak attachment to Islam. And so we treat them as, as Muslims and inshallah, we try to educate them. And uh, as long as they believe in the obligations, uh, then that, that would make their Islam to be valid and, and, and to be sound. However, if they say uh, prayer is not wajib and hajj is not wajib and, and it's not from Islam and they start saying these things, 
this now calls into question their Islam and so therefore we, we educate them and establish the proof upon them and if they persist after this even after clear evidence then clearly it means that there's something more than just ignorance that is behind 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 this and this, this would, would be disbelief but in general uh, we treat them to be uh, Muslims uh, who need educating mm -hmm. and we, we, we treat their Islam to, to be valid unless we see something clearly from them mm -hmm. that shows they are rejecting something upon upon knowledge. So this is how we, we would treat them inshallah ta'ala. Mm -hmm. Jazakallah khair. Barakallah khair. for this beneficial lecture. Uh, we hope to hear from you soon and uh, sorry for taking your time. In the no. Uh, pleasure to pleasure to uh, meet hook up with you guys. Zakalah. Ah yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.